Hi, I'm Gretchen Sable, and I'm president of League of Women Voters ABC. ABC stands for Anoka, Blaine, Coon Rapids, or maybe it's Andover, Bethel, Champlain. Who knows? But anyhow, we serve most of Anoka County, plus a little bit of northern Hennepin County, with League of Women Voters kinds of activities, which include um, forums for candidates, we do voter registration, we do education on topics, and tonight is an educational meeting. Um, and we're going to talk about climate change, but it's climate change with kind of a difference. It's climate change and then what people in our community are actually doing in their personal lives to make a difference. So that's what we're going to talk about. Um, the speakers tonight are myself. I'm going to do kind of a general intro. And then we have with us Peggy Quam from the League of Women Voters, Minnetonka Eden Prairie Hopkins, or MEF. <laughs> And um, she's going to talk about her home that she built, which is really interesting. And then we're going to break up and we're going to go visit the people at our resource fair here. So that's kind of the plan for the night. Um, and I'm just going to dig in here. So the topic for today is climate change. You can make a difference. And you see right there, that's one of our members, Betsy Kefauver, and she's saying, I need to be able to tell my grandchildren that I did not stay silent. A big part of this is talking about it. So we're starting to talk about it tonight. So you know, I think that we all know that climate change is important. The viability of Minnesota's industries, farms, and utilities hinges on clean water, and climate change is going to affect all that. So it's our industries, it's our farms, it's our utilities, and our cities are all going to be affected. You know, some people say that they don't believe in climate change. This graphic shows from 1850 to, to the current day you can see how much warmer the Earth is. And given the age of the Earth, this is really a, a small snap, snapshot in time, snapshot in time. And, but I'll talk more about that. You can see, though, that it is warming. This little graph here shows you from 1958 to today the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide works to, like a lens, and the heat comes through and concentrates in the Earth, and it can't escape again. We call that the greenhouse effect. We've known about that for decades. Um, and this, the black line there shows that. The wavy red lines are the yearly variation in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as the great forests of the northern hemisphere grow leaves and go dormant. So that's the carbon dioxide difference from year to year. This next picture goes way back. So you can see it goes back to 800,000 years ago. And we're able to do that because we can look at ice cores and soil cores and, and measure how much carbon dioxide was in the atmosphere then. And we can see that for eons, 800,000 years almost, we had levels below that dotted blue line. In 2008, you can see there with the blue arrow, that's what we've observed in 2008. So already we're over that. Um, you know, now we're 11 years beyond that. And when you project out, so at the rate that we're going now, our carbon levels would be at this green dot, more than 550 parts per million, um, if we are actually able to lower things. And if we're not, we could be up at 900 parts per million. And that is a place that the Earth has never been. And we're not sure what it would look like. Um, if we look at the average temperatures here in Minnesota, these are some maps from the DNR. On the left, you see the um, change in 30 years, from 1924 to 2018. You can see that the, the, the dotted line at the, in the lower one there that goes kind of from Hinkley to Fargo, that would be the, um, where the 40 degree average yearly temperature was in 24, 1924, and now in 2018, we're from Duluth to Grand Forks. So you can see that we've really gotten warmer in Minnesota. We've also gotten wetter. The, the map on the right shows a similar data, the 26-inch isobar from 1989 to 1895 to 24, yeah. So anyhow, you can see the difference there. We've gotten wetter. Um, this is actually constituting a public health emergency. We have seen, we have seen stronger waves uh, stronger storms, heat waves, droughts, wildfires, floods, storms. We're also having more problems with heat-related disorders, um, you know, people dying from heat waves, people dying from chronic kidney disease. And climate change increases air pollution, which will also kill more people. And then CO2 increases, CO2 increase decreases our cognitive performance. I just demonstrated that um, <laughs> by, by being unable to talk, yes. So, you know, there's a lot of things that's going to, 
going to make a difference. So, okay, it's important, but what can I do? You know, and it's real easy. I lost a lot of sleep over this. I have really gotten to the point that it was just making me crazy, and I, I was getting depressed, and I didn't know what to do. But part of it is, nope, the world's not going to end in 12 years. It'll just be different. And then we have to move on with things. So part of moving on is to recognize that we've got some problems. This was um, a headline from, what, November 4th. The U.S. formally begins to leave the Paris Climate Accords. And so we're seeing that the Trump administration is drawing us out now. It'll be complete this time next year after the one-year waiting time has elapsed. Um, Mike Pompeo said that we're going to continue to work with our global partners to enhance resilience to the impacts of climate change, and prepare for and respond to natural disasters. So at least the administration does admit that there's climate change. Um, but we're the only country out of the 200 signers to pull out. So that's serious, and, and you know, it doesn't make me sleep any better. But there's things that we can do. And so within our Minnesota um, House of Representatives, Melissa Hortman has formed the Climate Action Caucus in the Minnesota House, and she's going to be working with that. Melissa is a, le a legislator from our area. This is, um, she put out a, a bulletin October 8th that went to the people on her mailing list, and this is a an um, a excerpt from that bulletin, they're going to work to pass this plan during the 2020 session. And so they're going to need support from people. If this is something you want to do, you can advocate for that. Um, and then also, communities matter. So through my work with League of Women Voters Upper Mississippi, I made contact with the League of Women Voters of Madison, Wisconsin. They call themselves Dane County. And they just did a program on November 6th, Why Local Governments Matter. It's an excellent program. You can Google up LWV Dane Local Governments Matter and see what local jurisdictions are doing in Dane County. Because as things at the top aren't working, the bottom can come up and fill those gaps and, and actually be stronger than we would be if it was coming down from the top. So this is our opportunity to, to dig in and do these things. So tonight with us, we're going to have some local leaders here tonight. Marsha Badino couldn't be here, but she sent some information. Marsha got us started on our zero waste meetings, and now Sue Dragance has taken this to new levels. Now when we have our meetings, we serve a meal, and we wash our dishes, and we do not have waste. So that was Marsha, and now it's Sue. Uh, Marsha also does gardening. She has a no-till garden system that she uses where the soil is actually very healthy. The soil stores lots of carbon in the roots and the microorganisms in the soil. So she has some material on that here. With us, we also have Jerry Hemmingson. Jerry lives here in Andover. He's got five acres, and he's been planting prairie plants. And they, these plants and trees he's been putting in store carbon, which is good. And he's also looking at plants from south of us. So that as our climate warms, his gardens are going to be beautifully resilient with plants that are already meant for that kind of climate. We have Ellen Hadley here talking about line three opposition and the climate impacts from line three. And she'll have information for us. Sue DeGantz, again, has Anoka Area Climate Action, and she's got some information about that. We have Deanne Christensen and Lonnie McCauley are both here to talk about solar expansion in Coon Rapids and some work that they're doing. And so you'll see when you talk to them that what they're doing is trying to get jump-started on building more solar capacity municipally in our, in our areas. Um, we may have some Tesla owners here to talk to you about their electric cars. And the next speaker then is going to be Peggy Kwam with her net zero house example, which I think you'll find fascinating. So. Um, a little bit more, you know, these are just things, that, these are examples, and there's things that you can do, things that I can do. You can change your transportation mode. You can be more energy efficient. You can eat less meat. You can be active and advocate for things. Um, we will be having a Minnesota Climate Action Day on April 22nd, and so that's something that you can go to the Capitol and shake things up about. So this is kind of our call to arms and our call to personal responsibility to do these things. So now I'll turn it over to Peggy, and I'll let her go. All right. So I'm Peggy Kavam, and I'm the president of the League of Women, of Women Voters in Minnetonka, Eden Prairie, and the Hopkins, otherwise known as MEF. So I'm supposed to look at Bruce. That's hard. <laughs> um, I want to talk about our net zero energy home, but also other ways we're helping the planet in my family, because um, 
not everybody can go out and build a house, but there's lots of things you can do that are really make, going to make an impact. Um, just to give you a little background, my husband and I lived in Minnetonka for 34 years, and we decided that the house that we bought when we were in our 20s really wasn't the house that we wanted to age in place in. It had a lot of drawbacks, and we wanted to build because then we could get all the features that we wanted. And um, the Minnetonka Eden Prairie Hopkins area is pretty well fully developed, and we didn't really want to do a teardown. And I thought it would be years before we found a place where we could build our retirement dream home. So when we decided we were going to start looking, I got online. And within an hour, I found a lot, which is what we wound up buying within a couple of weeks. It was. It was sort of a leftover unmarketed lot that was in a development where the builder had gone bankrupt and he had sold all the lots except one to a different developer. And he kept that one for himself and it was a really nice lot. And through some weird circumstances, it became available. So we snapped it up. And so we have a beautiful lot in Eden Prairie within walking distance to the Future Light Rail Station. Um, so it'll be walkable, and we've got nature. We're right next to parkland that's a conservancy area, and we're really excited about it. So anyway, we wanted to build, and we wanted to build a green home, and we had no clue what that would mean. <laughs> so we went um, internet shopping for a builder, and like I mentioned, we weren't expecting to be doing this for years, <laughs> and all of a sudden we found a lot, and we said, having to find a builder right away. And we, we found a green builder who builds what's called zero energy ready homes. It's a certification. Let's go to the next slide. It's a certification from the US Department of Energy that um, it, it's a certification used across the country that uh, makes, it sort of specifies a lot of things, more than just your carbon footprint, which is zero. It specifies all these things here on the list, healthful environment and comfort and advanced technology, efficient quality and durability. So you're getting so much more than just a zero carbon footprint. You're getting a really, really great environment. And we're so impressed by our house. We moved in in the end of June, by the way. So it's really new still to us. Um, and so if you look at this chart, those, the gray and blue and green bars kind of show you the difference. The gray is sort of how homes that were built between 1990 and 2010 are. Now remember, our house is built in 77, so it's not even on the chart, <laughs> our old house. So you look at the gray, that's sort of like a, a typical, pretty new in my mind house. And then the blue is an Energy Star certified home. We've all heard about Energy Star, and we buy appliances that are Energy Star. And then the DOE Zero Energy Ray home is an even more advanced qualification. And that's what we're meeting. Um, I put these links here, wondering if there was an internet connection to this computer. So if there was, we could play a few videos. But if there isn't, I'll just move on, because <laughs> they're kind of cool videos. So just to explain a little bit more about what those six factors are, um, the health environment one is that you, they um, want to minimize the pollutants and give you fresh air. So we have what's called an HRV. It's a, it's a heat exchanger with the fresh air coming in. It does a little heat exchange or a cool exchange if it's summer with the air in the house. So it brings in fresh air, but temperature cleans it up to the right temperature and then brings it into the house because our house is sealed so tight that if we didn't have that, we would probably suffocate or something. I don't know. It wouldn't be very comfortable, but it works great. Um, and so this little fan runs automatically every now and then year round when it thinks we need to breathe a little bit. <laughs> um, and then the uh, comfort plus part that has to do with all the insulation, our house is really, really well sealed. They do something called a blow door test. Um, I wasn't present when they did it, but I guess they close all the doors <laughs> and the windows, obviously, and then they have this some kind of blower on the front door, and then they check the air pressure when they turn it on. And ours measured out to a, a figure that it was 0.59, and that's really hard to do. There's a passive home 
spec and their spec is to be 0.6 or lower so we met the passive home spec and we are not a passive home. Um, we, our builder was surprised too. It was the first time he'd met <laughs> that's the passive home spec. So it's really well sealed, which means that the cold air is not getting in now. Uh, the works better one, um, there's a lot of advanced technologies for, for how you build a house, and you're going to see some of those in some of the pictures I show you about things that our house did. And they're not that weird, but um, when you put it all together, you get a good product. Uh, efficient. Because our house is so well sealed and so well insulated, we don't need a big furnace. And we have a solar array that, that provides the equivalent of all electricity we use. Um, the quality built thing, is, our builder not only does he build quality, but he builds to a LEED specification. But we are not LEED certified because it's quite expensive to ha go through that certification process, but he uses Green Guard LEED type of materials, and so those are all, um, they're like locally sourced, and there, there's no VOCs, and you know, there's no formaldehyde, things like that. So, so that's part of that quality, and it, it, we're happy about that. We like that. And then the durability, I hope it's durable. <laughs> we'll find out. It's supposed to withstand an F3 tornado, <laughs> according to him. So, so the Department of Energy, even now, has what's called a Housing Innovation Award Program. They started that in 2013, and our builder only builds two or three homes a year. So he entered our home this year, and the, the uh, entry was due on June 14th at 5 p.m., and our solar panels were installed on June 14th in the afternoon. So at 2.30 p.m., he took a picture when they were installed on the roof and sent, finished his application and got it in time for the deadline. And then we won. <laughs> there were a number of about five categories. So we won for an award for the custom homes over 2,500 square foot category. So that was pretty exciting. Um, there were five winners in each category, and so we were one of the winners from across the country for the innovation that he used in building our, our net zero energy certified house. And so the material I'm going to show you is coming from our profile that's on the website showing all the winners. So you can look it up too. So it's, it's right here, buildings.energy.gov slash zero. So I just borrowed from their website since it was kind of all ready to go. So that's our house. There's our certification that we're a winner. Um, it's in Eden Prairie. It's a, a little bit over 3,000 square feet. It's a five bedroom house, two bedrooms up and three downstairs, and it's a walkout basement. And so there's our, our profile that these pictures are from is, is listed there in that link. And these are some of the, the uh, key figures for what our net zero energy home is. Um, it's really hard to get zero energy in our cold climate, um, but we did it. So this, this HERS score here is um, it's a rating system. that you, We have a professional rater that comes in and rates the house, and a house that's built to code right now would be at, zero, would be at 100 on that, on that uh, rate, rating thing. And um, when if you were at zero, that means you're zero energy. And we, ours scored negative two, so it meant we're even a little bit better. But when they scored it, they didn't know what we had on the electric car. Well, it's a plug-in hybrid, so we're drawing a little more current to feed that hybrid. So I think we're using every bit that we generate on our solar system. But anyway, we're right there, right around zero. So what they calculate then is, you know, we're not just saving the plant, we're saving a lot of money. <laughs> our average energy bill is, is less than the fee of having the service. You know, the hookup fee is crazy. Um, so they say $10 a month is our average monthly energy bill because um, we have electric service, but we also have gas because we have one gas appliance in our house. It's the furnace for when it's colder than the air source heat pump can keep up. So when it's colder than 25 degrees, 
which it already is, <laughs> we have to run gas. But whether we're running gas or not, we have to pay a gas bill of $14.5 just for the hookup fee. So that kind of drove me crazy this summer. Every month I get my $14.5 gas bill for not having it with a zero, a big zero for the used gas. So that's why there's an average monthly energy bill, because we have these hookup fees whether we're using energy or not. But even with that, our annual savings I calculate versus my neighbor's houses is $4,000 a year, or in 30 years, we save almost 200 grand. So nothing to sneeze at. So some key features in our house. Um, I'm not a construction person, but you learn a lot watching your house go up from nothing to a hole in the ground to walls going up to things going on the walls. So this kind of shows you some of the stuff. There's um, lots of foam <laughs> in our house, layers and layers of foam, and I'll show you some pictures later. There's foam in the walls and inside the walls, outside the walls, underneath the, the basin floor, in the ceilings, there's foam everywhere. Lots of foam went in the dumpsters, the overordered foam. We were quite shocked <laughs> at that, too. Every time they use a piece, they want to cut it to the right shape, and they throw out all the rest. Even if there's a lot left, they don't piece it together. So if you ever build, tell them, reuse your foam. <laughs> um, so the roof has lots of sheathing and foam and shingles, of course. As overhangs because of the, the sun, you're trying to not let the summer sun in the heat, but you want the winter sun to come in. Um, let's see, you got, we've got triple pane windows and lots of air sealing. That when they put in the windows and they put in this thing they call acoustical sealant, it's, a, it's like glue, but it never gets hard. So it's always a good seal. But don't touch it when they're building because it gets stuck in your jacket and you'll never come off. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's on the back. You aren't leaning on it. <laughs> but um, it, it's pretty interesting, all the tricks that they have that they don't use in, in most building. It's pretty simple to put this acoustical sealant on first, but nobody really does that. Um, the ventilation, I talked about the HRV. Sometimes they call it ERV. I think they're actually different things, but they're, they both have to do with fresh air coming in and getting conditioned. And then um, we have a very efficient gas furnace. It's only this big. It's this little tiny thing. <laughs> um, we have an electric hot water tank. That's, that thing's huge. It's 100 gallons. And it looks really weird in the, in the mechanical room because there's only those two things, this little tiny furnace and this giant water heater. And it's giant because the recovery time for Electric oh, hot water heating is very slow, so you want to heat it gradually and efficiently, um, but that's slow. So they want it so big that you'll never run out when you use hot water. Um, all of our lighting is LED, so that's the most efficient lighting you can have now. And we are really surprised at how much choice you have in LED lighting. All these nice fixtures are available in LED. And I think just a few years ago, you couldn't get that. But now you can. And as you wouldn't be surprised, all of our appliances are Energy Star rated. We have a solar system that's 12 kilowatt photovoltaic. It's cells on the roof. I'll show you some of that later. Um, all of our Appliances that use water are rated water sense, which is another standard. So our house is certified water sense. It's a standard for low water usage. And much to the dismay of our homeowners association, we didn't put in an irrigation system because we didn't want to be water sense rated house and then start throwing away water out in the lawn. And we planted our yard with fescue. It's growing in very thin and our HOA board is very dismayed with us. We are on we are on guard. <laughs> I, I don't know how things will go, but there's a lot of tension <laughs> because I want to have a very water conserving landscape, and it's they don't believe that's the right image. <laughs> so this will be interesting as we try to get approval as we want to plant things because they're already unhappy with my lawn that didn't grow very fast. It was hot this summer. <laughs> It didn't grow well. 
Um, and then also we made sure that our house was um, ADA compliant because this is our age in place house. So it's a single level with, with a no stair front entry and an ADA compliant bathroom. One of the bathrooms is ADA compliant and wide hallways and um, it just, it's just ready to go with levers for the doorknobs. So we, my husband's already got arthritis issues so he wanted to make sure we had levers and we're trying to think ahead on what we're gonna need there. Um, and we have an electric vehicle charging station in the garage. So I have the full floor plans over there on that table if anyone wants to see it. Um, but this is just sort of a, a sketch that wasn't a very good resolution from the uh, website. <laughs> I just copied it in. So the main entry is right there. There's a triple three-car garage there. And the, you go in, there's this big... Um, living room, kitchen, dining room area, and out back is, is this conservation area, this marsh, so our windows look out there, and that's west, so we can see the sunsets, it's really nice. And this is south, so our solar array is on the roof over this, so it's facing south, and we set the house back from the lot line because there are trees at this lot, so we didn't want any shade on the solar array, so we, we kind of tucked the house behind the garage and left it room so that it still gets sunshine even as those trees grow next door. So there's our house from the back. Um, one of the things that helped make that um, blow door test work out well is it's basically square without any of those offsets that they like to do. You know, houses, they all like to have the cantilevered bay windows and all these things. Well, every time you do that, you kind of mess up your energy thermal envelope. And we didn't want to do that. We thought the energy efficiency was more important than having this architecturally lumpy house. <laughs> but that's another thing the Neighborhood Association doesn't like, because our house doesn't really look like the rest. <laughs> but it functions. <laughs> I think it looks pretty. <laughs> we, one of the neighbors went over, he wanted to see our house, and he's out here on the deck, and he's looking around the back. He says, don't you have a deck? <laughs> he was on the deck, he said, don't you have a deck? Because most of the houses have this vast deck along the back looking out at this nature area. But I had room that's more private here behind the garage than on the deck, because then we'd be looking at their deck. And <laughs> they said, don't you have a deck? Because we didn't have this big, huge, expansive, fancy deck. So that's the kind of neighborhood we're living in. <laughs> but anyway, this illustration was from the, um, the uh, website and talked about the rigid foam. Underneath the siding, there's two inch thick rigid foam around the whole house. And then underneath the uh, roof, there's R60 insulation, you know, right here at the ceiling. And, and it's both closed cell spray foam and blown fiberglass. I never went up there, but my husband did to look at it and check and see what it looks like. Um, and then we have ridge vents and light colored shingles. That all, all helps. And this is where the solar array is going to go. So this was taken for the application before that day it was due <laughs> when the solar, solar cells went up. So that's inside. It's just a, the illustration that all of our plumbing fixtures are water sense and our appliances are energy star. Um, one thing that maybe you'll be interested in, this floor looks like wood, but that's actually tile. And so that's really durable. It's really good if we end up in a walker or wheelchair situation. And it's also good for thermal mass as the house, you know, heats up and cools down like a passive house, that you keep that thermal mass in there and maintain that temperature level. So it does a lot of things. And we think it looks really pretty. Um, that's downstairs. Um, mentioned that the LED bulbs. I brought one of our discs. These look like recessed can lights. and, and when you do that, you break your thermal insulation, and it, it's a really tough thing. But if you use these low-profile disc lights, you don't break it at all because it's actually in the room. And so I brought one over. You can see it during the show-and-tell part. 
And that's the uh, ADA compliant bathroom. It's got a walk-in shower with no threshold on the entry and grab bars in the shower and grab bars are on the toilet and a wheelchair pull-up vanity. So hopefully I will be able to stay here for 34 more years. <laughs> Um, that sort of shows the insulation after they built it and have all the studs in there, then they sprayed this foam in here through and through. So it's another several inches of closed cell foam that makes it really warm. And there it shows some more. It also makes it rigid, and that's part of why it would withstand the F3 tornado, because it, it gets very solid once it's sprayed in there. Um, there's foam, too, on the parts that later on got covered, you know, they're under grade, so there's foam all the way down below, and then it's Tyvek wrapped. And there's foam underneath the basement slab, too, before they, yeah, they put in foam, and then they put in gravel, and then they poured in the concrete, and then they tiled it, so it's really well insulated. The basement floor doesn't even feel cold. And we did not use in-floor heating, we, we just, you know, just use regular forced air heating. So there's, the furnace is this little part right here. <laughs> That's the little furnace, it's about 30 inches tall. And then this is the water heater, this great big thing here. And that's about it in the mechanical room. <laughs> um, so there's a lot more that we do besides build a new house and I thought I'd share that with you because there's so much that goes into creating the greenhouse gases. And I, I copied this little chart from a website called drawdown.org that shows some of the areas that will make the biggest, they're the, big, the biggest bang for the buck for global warming solutions. And you know, most of the things I listed, I do sort of feed right into those. So the ones that make the big bang for buck are refrigerants, wind turbines, reduced food waste, plant-rich diet, tropical forests, educating girls, family planning, solar farms, silvopasture, which is raising your cows in the woods so they fertilize the trees and then the trees keep the climate right and the cows eat the grass under the trees. And that's what it is, it's not separating everything out. And then rooftop solar. So some of the things that we do, um, and this isn't all of them, but I thought they were some of the more interesting ones. We have rooftop solar, and I'll show you some more on that. Uh, we try to eat a plant-rich diet. Um, I'm, even though I live in the suburbs and there's not much transportation, it was really important to me to choose a lot by the, the upcoming Southwest Light Rail extension, so, so we will be users of the light rail. And I grew up in St. Paul, so I used the bus, and I bike all the time. I still bike all the time. In fact. Gretchen recruited me to do this while we are biking on <laughs> a bike ride. Um, so reduced food waste, um, electric vehicles, we've got a plug-in hybrid, walkable bicycle cities, recycling, build with wood. I think we got a guy back there who's doing that. That goes hand in hand with planting trees. Trees suck up the carbon, but then if when they're at the end of life, you just let them die and rot or burn them, well, then you're releasing all that carbon back out. But if you build with wood, you're keeping that carbon captured and sequestered. So it's, it's really important to build with wood and efficient appliances. So here's a couple slides on, my, on our solar system. And if you've got sunlight, anybody can do this. Solar panels are getting cheaper and cheaper. Um, so we have 39 panels on our roof, and that, that's rated at AC, it'll generate about 10 kilowatts. They turned it on on August 6th, and so when I did this slide, we'd had 12 weeks going, and that had already generated almost four megawatt hours, and I think that's quite a lot. And according to the app on my phone, because everything has an app on the phone, we already saved 5,823 pounds of CO2 emissions, and that was the equivalent to planting 147 trees. And that's only 12 weeks <laughs> on one house. So it's pumping. Um, Excel gets, gets um, credit for that. They get a 
but they incentivize us to do this. So they, they get a renewable energy credit, and in exchange, we get cash. So they pay us seven cents a kilowatt hour for everything we generate as an extension of their utility so that they can claim the renewable energy credit from us. And that helps pay for the construction costs of putting in solar. Um, that, that applies to anybody, if you put it on your house or whatever. But they are scaling back that program. We have friends who did it last year, and they got eight cents a kilowatt hour. And we did it this year, and we only get seven cents a kilowatt hour. So I don't know if it's phasing out, but it's definitely phasing down. And then the IRS gives us a 30% installation tax credit. So that also helps with the cost of putting that on. And um, that's phasing down for sure. This is the last year that's at 30% unless Congress pumps it back up again. But if you go by the laws, I think it's dropping down to 27% or something next year. It's going down. Um, so when, our house, when it's sunny, we generate way more power than we need. And there's a little cursor on the meter that runs forward when we're generating it. And then there's the meter that we, is what we use. And if we're using less than we're generating, the glue cursor runs backwards. And we love to see it run backwards, because <laughs> that means we're earning money, too. <laughs> and we're saving the planet. Double bonus. Um, so I even looked today. It's winter. <laughs> Feels like winter. And I had the oven running, and I had the dryer running. And I went outside, and it was running backwards, because <laughs> it was sunny, and I was so excited. <laughs> it's still running backwards. But all of our unused power goes into the grid, and they apply it as a credit at the same value we buy power at to our bill. So that what, if I run the dryer at night, obviously I'm not generating power. So Excel is racking up the bill, but then they put credit for during the day. So it all is supposed to end up at zero over the course of a year. That's what the net zero part is. So this is a graph off of our app. Um, showing our power th through our, um, this is a month, this is the month of October. So you can tell when it's sunny and rainy and when, you know, it's, it really varies a lot. And we can get that by day or month or instantaneous. And here's our array, it even tells us each, each uh, panel's production. We've got one dud. And uh, when I was putting this together, we were awaiting the builder to fix that. And he, he came on October 29th with a new optimizer, because they thought it must be the optimizer. And he replaced it, and it didn't solve the problem. So now we have a new solar panel sitting in our garage, waiting for it to warm up when somebody can come out and put in the new solar panel, and hopefully that'll fix it. But you know, it's generating lots of power even without that panel, but it'd be nice to get all of them. And as luck would have, that's really awkward to get at. <laughs> it's up near the top, and it's inside, and they hate going up there <laughs> and doing that. Um, so another thing that we do is the electric vehicle. And I bought a Kia Nero plug-in hybrid this spring. And so it's mostly a gas car. It gets about 46 miles a gallon. But it's got a battery that's good for a 26-mile range. So if I'm just going to Target or something, I'm running on electricity. And electricity is cleaner, and it's free from our system. But even if I'm getting off the grid, it's, it's cleaner and in half the price of the gas that it would use. Even at 46 miles per gallon, it's about half the price. So it's a better way to go. And so this is nice. I think the hybrid is a nice way to do it because you don't have that range anxiety that you would get if you had a purely electric car and you wanted to go somewhere further than your range. And where do you go plug it in? And what do you do while it's charging? So, so I like it. It's a good car. And it, it had a federal tax credit, too. So even though it's a plug-in hybrid and costs more than the gas-only version, because it has a $4,500 tax credit, that brings the price right down to the same as a gas version. So it's kind of a no-brainer to get a car like that. The only problem is we wanted to get a certain model of this, um, and there weren't any in the whole state <laughs> we wanted to get. I mean, you could get a high-end one, but I didn't want to pay for all the bells and whistles. And so we happened to be in Salt Lake City for a vacation. I thought, let's check out that car, because there's a Kia dealer 
a block away from our hotel. And I started looking at that on the internet and I saw that not only is there a Q dealer, they had the car I wanted and it was $2,000 off list. So I actually called and said, I'm bringing my title down because if I like this, I'm gonna buy it while I'm there. And I bought it <laughs> while I was there. And it worked out really well. And it's a nice car, it's been reliable. And, and I'm saving lots of uh, carbon gases by running on electric almost all the time. So there's something about the mass transportation. We've got, this is the Green Line extension. So this is like right now, it goes from downtown Minneapolis to downtown St. Paul, you know, it goes through the U. And we, we're season ticket holders for volleyball at the U, so we're going all, all the time out there now. And, and I'm really sick of rush hour driving the game, so I am looking forward to taking the train. But there's so many other reasons to take transit. Um, it eases congestion for everybody to have that there, and it saves money, and it reduces greenhouse gas. It's more relaxing. And as I age and I have more difficulty driving at night or whatever, it'll be there. So I'm a big supporter of this line, even though it's been a hard sell for many years. It's, it's kind of hard to believe it's actually coming after decades of discussion in our area. Um, one more thing, the plant-rich diet. To do that, we subscribe to a CSA, which is Community Support Agriculture. And that's just, you, you pay in advance to a farm to deliver you a box of vegetables every week. And they're fresh picked. They usually pick them that morning and you get them and they taste so good. Um, and the reason to do that is beef production is a big greenhouse gas contributor for a couple reasons. They belch methane gas. So it's a very direct reason, but also the grazing on the pasture, it means they deforested to do that, and the uh, feed that they eat, the corn, is, was deforested too, so growing corn is another greenhouse gas uh, contributor. So vegetable boxes are a way of getting, not eating so much meat that would do that. And so we also like that we're supporting our local farmers and the local community. And I like trying new vegetables and trying to find recipes. You know, what is this thing? What do you do with that? It's kind of fun. And it's, the most CSAs have a newsletter and they're very tuned to the weather and the climate and how things have changed over the years. And so it's really interesting to get a real awareness of, of what's going on in your environment from the farmer's eyes through your CSA newsletter. And, and that, I like that. So this is my last slide. I just have some resources. And if Gretchen has a copy of this, if so, if she wants to get to anybody, she can. But there's my builder, there's Ameris Homes, and the website for Department of Energy with the Zero Wear Energy Homes, and the website for Excel. There's a website for electric vehicles that um, has some information about them. And there's a directory for all the CSAs in the area. So I think that's it. Well, thank you, Peggy. Um, so I will promise that we'll put, um, when, when this becomes available online, we'll post a link to this presentation online. We'll also put the slides there so that people can see them and, and access those resources. So thank you all for coming tonight and for watching the video. Now we're going to go ahead and have our research fair. Thank you very much. <laughs>